Arsenal Tunnel Syndrome by Matthew Geringer, Milo Martinez, Caleb Meldy, and Brandon Plyler. Tarsal tunnel syndrome, or TTS, is commonly caused by the entrapment and compression of the posterior tibial nerve and its branches under the flexor retinaculum in the posterior compartment of the leg. The incidence of TTS has been reported more in females than males, with 20 to 40 percent of cases stemming from an unknown origin. Causes of entrapment of the posterior tibial nerve can be from trauma, which includes sprains, strains, fractures, bony deformities, space-occupying lesions, and obesity, to name a few. Entrapment can also be caused by extrinsic factors like tight shoes, casts, or participation in repetitive and strenuous activities, such as running or jogging. The medial malleolus of the tibia acts as a guide for the tendons of the posterior tibialis muscle, the flexor digitorum longus, and the flexor hallucis longus as they travel to their attachments on the plantar surface of the foot. The posterior tibial artery, vein, and nerve also travel through this tunnel. The roof of this tunnel is made up by the flexor retinaculum. The acronym Tom, Dick, and a Nervous Harry can be very helpful in memorizing what structures pass through the tarsal tunnel. The T stands for the T in posterior tibial muscle. The D stands for the D in flexor digitorum longus, and the A stands for the artery in nerve, and H stands for flexor hallucis longus. The sole of the foot is innervated by the medial plantar nerve on the medial side, the lateral plantar nerve on the lateral side, both of which are branches of the tibial nerve, and the medial and lateral calcaneal branches towards the posterior of the sole of the foot. Irritation of the nerve can cause symptoms that are generally unilateral and include pain along the pathway of the nerve, numbness, tingling, burning, cramping, throbbing, and muscle weakness in the foot. Subjective information from the patient will be important because the most important complaint will be irritation along the distribution of the tibial nerve, which is depicted here in red, blue, and green. The red portion is the calcaneal branch. The blue and green are the medial and lateral plantar branches. Your patient could present with irritation of a single branch or any combination of the three branches, depending on where the nerve is being compromised. They may also complain of symptom amplification with prolonged standing or walking and increased pain at night. Observation of posture will also be helpful because a pes planus deformity will many times put tension on the nerve. Also, in chronic cases, a patient may present with abductor and flexor weakness, typically starting with the great toe. Some helpful tests you may want to consider during your exam include palpation over the flexor retinaculum, which would produce or increase symptoms. Tennel sign is performed by tapping over the depicted area, attempting to change or reproduce symptoms. The dorsiflexion eversion test and the inversion test may both increase symptoms. When dorsiflexing and everting the foot, you are putting tension on the nerve, and when inverting the foot, you are decreasing the volume of the tarsal tunnel, both of which could reproduce pain or increase symptoms. Other tests that may assist with diagnosis are radiographs, ultrasound, and MRI to look for fractures or space-occupying lesions or collisions. Nerve conduction tests aren't really used as a diagnostic test, but rather as a confirmation of the diagnosis. Some additional things you may want to consider with this patient are polyneuropathies, which is more likely with chronic alcohol abusers or diabetics, also radiculopathy, compartment syndrome, Morton's neuroma or metatarsalgia, which is a benign neuroma typically between the third and fourth metatarsal. This patient will usually complain of a feeling like stepping on a marble or a small rock. And then also plantar fasciitis, which is probably the most common misdiagnosis. Conservative physical therapy management is categorized into acute, subacute, and settled stages. In the acute stage, the therapist should initially reduce inflammation, tissue stress, and pain. This impairment-based approach may utilize physical agents, orthotics, taping, therapeutic exercise, and or manual therapy depending upon the patient's needs. In the subacute stage, the goal of therapy is to improve strength and flexibility. 
PT management in the settled stage should improve functional mobility, strength, and flexibility bilaterally. Therapeutic exercise, including the strengthening of the posterior tibialis and weight bearing, should be utilized. If impairments are present, then impairment based therapy should be used here as well. If surgery is needed, then surgical options include posterior tibial nerve decompression and cryosurgery. If a space occupying lesion is found, then it will be removed and decompression will not be performed. Post surgical physical therapy management is broken down into three phases. Phase 1 rehabilitation is performed in the first three weeks after surgery. In this phase, the patient should be educated on wound care and non-weight-bearing precautions. Passive range of motion should be performed to maintain joint mobility, and edema should be addressed. Phase 2 is between 3 to 6 weeks after surgery. In Phase 2, the patient should progress from non-weight-bearing to weight-bearing as tolerated. Passive, active, assistive, and active range of motion should be performed. Prevention of fibrosis adhesions and gait training are important factors in Phase 2, and aquatic therapy may be started here as well. Phase 3 management takes place between 6 to 12 weeks after surgery. Gait training, strengthening, flexibility, balance and proprioception, as well as task-specific training and health and wellness promotion should be tackled in this phase. Evidence shows that surgical procedures are relatively effective for tarsal tunnel syndrome, and relatively little harm has been reported in these surgical interventions. To ensure effective physical therapy, comparable signs need to be taken, and these include palpation and observation, checking for muscle atrophy, gait analysis, posture analysis, balance testing, manual muscle testing of the ankle and foot flexors, goniometry measurements, accessory joint mobility, sensation, uh, pain ratings before and after treatment, and really good outcome measures as well can be the tunnel sign and the dorsiflexion eversion test. Research by Ahmad et al. found that in 80% of the cases the mechanism could be identified and thusly the prognosis associated with post-surgical decompression was good. Dellen et al. also found that comorbidities such as obesity and diabetes could worsen the prognosis. Permanent nerve tissue damage can result from delayed treatment as well as increased severity of damage to those nerves. A positive tinnel sign is indicative of favorable outcomes because that means that the nerve is actually still sending signals. Precautions should be taken when using thermal modalities with patients that have hypertension and acute wounds. Thermal modalities are contraindicated for any patient with impaired sensation, circulation, or cognition, as well as cancer, uh, edema issues, and skin infections. Cryotherapy is contraindicated for patients with syndromes related to cold sensitivity. Another major precaution has to do with educating the patient about discontinuing the possible mechanism of injury. This could be running, jogging, jumping, uh, many studies in Japan included judo. These activities could have been causing the tarsal tunnel syndrome. Also, educate the patient on avoiding restrictive footwear and bandaging and or casting that could be causing the entrapment. The bottom line is that the entrapment of the posterior tibial nerve leading to tarsal tunnel syndrome can be caused by a variety of intrinsic and extrinsic factors stemming from a space occupying lesion all the way to disordered movement patterns. Currently, management for TTS includes conservative and surgical interventions that pose minimal complications with positive outcomes. However, the progress is still dependent on the identification of the mechanism of peripheral nerve compression and the influence of comorbidities. Thank you for your time and have a great day.